We've got okay. enough. Hi, everybody. Uh, see people are starting to file in here. My name is Matt. We'll be uh, starting shortly on the webinar for managing your Windows infrastructure with Puppet Bolt. Give another minute or so for people to come in, and then we'll uh, get ourselves started. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started here with the uh, the workshop. And as other people come in, I'll be saying the same things a, a couple of times here. Uh, most importantly, uh, if you do look in the chat section, you'll see what is referred to as a sticky note up at the top that says, click here to access your VM login information. So that's going to take you to a page if you click on it. Uh, that'll be where you can just throw your name in next to a machine. Uh, we've spun up a bunch of Windows servers in the cloud that we are going to be using as targets today for this workshop. Uh, so, you know, just click that link, go in, throw your name in, and later on, it'll make a lot more sense when we start working with both. I can see the anonymous platypus is typing, and that's just a wonderful alias. <clears throat> All right. Let's go ahead and get moving here. So this is me. My name is Matt Stone. I'm a senior solutions engineer here at Puppet uh, out of the Chicago area. And uh, one thing I'd like to just throw out here, and I'll, we'll come back around to it, but if you aren't familiar with the Puppet community Slack, uh, by all means, this is a great resource for, for further information, for help from the community, and you know people from Puppet are on there as well. Uh, so as you have you know questions beyond this workshop, uh, feel free. You can go to slack.puppet.com and get registered. And uh, then you know you can, there's a Bolt channel. There's a channel specifically for Windows users. Uh, I'm Soldo over there, um, longtime customer. Now been working here a couple of years, doing the fun stuff. Uh, with me today, I'd like to give some shout outs to the moderators. So uh, we have Ryan out of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Jerry out of uh, Colorado and Steve out of the Ohio area. And uh, Steve may be petting a puppy for a few minutes, but he'll be here, I assure you. And uh, so these are also solution engineers uh, that are going to be helping out today with any problems that you may encounter. So for those problems, uh, we do have a, a Q&A section here to answer questions. We have some chat here. Uh, I'd prefer if it's something where you have a, a more conceptual question that we can answer to the room. Uh, we can throw that in Q&A. Uh, otherwise, feel free to use those there at your disposal. Um, there is also a link for handouts. Uh, so right now, you will see a Bolt Workshop Preparation Guide. Um, you may have seen this as part of the description for the workshop to uh, pre-install Bolt before you come in. We're going to have that as the first exercise here. So if you haven't had a chance to do that, there will be some time to make sure you get that set up and working. Um, so some additional housekeeping here. Again, if you get stuck or have those issues, just throw the questions in the Q&A. Uh, if you are on some type of corporate VPN, that can conflict with your ability to reach out to these servers in AWS. So uh, by all means, if you can disconnect from there, you're going to, to get the best chance of connectivity. Uh, <clears throat> also, we'll be recording this. We will be able to supply you with it after the fact. So. Um, if you want to review it at a later time or, or spread this around for other people to, to work on it, 
uh, that will be available to you. So the agenda for today, um, first of all, we're gonna explain what Bolt is. So this, this is really more of an introductory course and it's focused around people that are uh, working in Windows environments. So we won't be touching any Linux systems today unless you're working in you know, subsystem for Linux or off of a, a terminal. Uh, this can all work inside of you know, PowerShell and connecting to Windows systems. Uh, we'll go through that installation and the configuration of Bolt, which includes some of these basics here, like uh, setting up an inventory file so we can put those hosts that you're filling out uh, on the other page. We can actually uh, you know, throw that into an inventory so we don't need to remember things like credentials and uh, we can file things by groups, things like that. Uh, and then we're going to walk through all the, the basic mechanisms here of what we can do inside of Bolt. So uh, at its simplest form, it's great for executing just uh, one-liner commands and scripts from the command line and scaling that out across your systems. And then we start adding to our, our capabilities and really powering up. Um, that'll be taking scripts and moving them to uh, something we call Bolt Tasks. Uh, which is essentially you know, gonna be a script with some guardrails on it that allows you to, to share that with others. And then we'll spend some time executing that, uh, those tasks and plans as well, which are uh, orchestrated steps. So we have a step-based workflow to run anything from those commands, tasks, and all through that chain. So this should all make a little more sense as we move through. Uh, at the end, we'll review everything we did today. We wanna keep some time here for, for Q&A. Um, you know, again, and I love to repeat this several times, but uh, feel free to use the, the Q&A that we have here to ask any questions. Um, we can have some conversations either, you know, I can respond straight over air here, or we can respond in those windows as we're moving through that material. Uh, but, you know, we're here to get you familiar with this stuff and uh, more than happy to, to answer what questions you have. Uh, so the target for today, again, uh, if you look at that sticky note in the chat, you should be able to see uh, a link to a bunch of different systems. Just put your name next to an empty one, and that's going to be the host that you use for today. Um, looks like, yeah, some people still need to fill in there. If you're having problems, uh, we have had people in the past that say can't get to Google Docs, and you need us to assign you one. Again, throw that into the chat and, and we can go ahead and take care of that. Uh, you will get a, uh, you know, a name similar to something like this. It'll have a, a different thing in front uh, and then classroom.puppet.com. The, uh, the credentials will be administrator and Puppet Labs. We, we do believe in security here. And uh, we'll use an alias to refer to that machine. So uh, this is a really long host name. And the, the one thing I've learned automating over the years is I just get lazy when it comes to typing in host names, right? So we're going to be building a web server today. We're just going to call it dub, dub, dub. And, and we can refer to it as that instead of you know, spending all that time copying and pasting or typing in a bunch of letters. Uh, so we're going to use Bolt to connect today over WinRM. We'll also discuss the other transports that are available to you. Um, optionally, depending on the time we have, and well, frankly, if you want to, uh, we should also have RDP open to these systems. So we'll be standing up a web server and talking about components uh, of what that it's doing inside those tasks and plans. Sometimes you want to go look at that machine and, and put your eyes on the changes that are being made. Uh, so you should have access to do that again with those same uh, administrator and puppet labs for the password. So. Let's move in here to our, our first section and explain what Bolt is. So uh, to start, Bolt is an open source tool for agentless automation and orchestration. So you can go download this free, throw it on your laptop, take over the world. Um, you might need a couple of root keys for that, but that's a different story. Um, it allows you to run everything. I think I covered most of this a couple slides back, but from a command to a, a full script, uh, and then allows you to, to migrate those into tasks or orchestrated plans. Uh, so we have this spectrum of what we can do with it, and then we can scale across a variety of transports. So we can use SSH, WinRM, uh, can actually connect to the Docker socket, or can use the Puppet agent. Uh, and we won't spend a lot of time talking about inside of Puppet Enterprise today, um, you know, anything that you will, we'll talk about the differences between like a bolt project versus adding something into puppet enterprise. 
Uh, just know this, that if you do need to use, um, you do need to hit a target for one of these tasks or script or anything like that, and you don't have uh, WinRM capabilities, the Puppet Agent can be deployed and it can be used as a transport. Um, the way I like to see it here is, you know, we have Puppet that does the desired state uh, management, and then we have Bolt. And, and between the two of those, we can really define that overall automation story. Bolt does a lot of the heavy lifting here for everything outside of desired state. So we can mix and match across all of these different varieties of you know, command scripts, task plans. We can even apply puppet code with it. Uh, so it really gives us this capability to, to look at a problem that we want to automate and then find the right steps we want to take to get there. Not everything may fit that desired state mold, and that's really where we're addressing the, the additional issues with Bolt. Now, if you are a Puppet Enterprise user, Bolt is included under the hood. You'll see, as long as you're in the uh, 2018 and up series, there'll be tasks and plans located in the console. These are Bolt tasks and plans. Uh, the, the advantages here is you'll be able to use things like role-based access controls to give you know, certain users or groups access to these tasks. Uh, and then you have some auditing and centralized operations. So we'll see as we're running these things today, output coming back to the command line. Uh, in, in the Puppet console, we'd actually see those inside the console. We can go through and see, like, Bob logged in, ran a task against these servers, and this was the output. Uh, so it's a little easier to centralize how we're going to do everything there and share that across teams. Uh, you also have that ability in, in PE to do scheduling for those tasks. So if it's something during a, an off window, it's an easy way to set it that way. Uh, so the types of commands. Uh, command at its simplest form. So by default, uh, Puppet is going to look at, or I'm sorry, Bolt will look at uh, connect to PowerShell on the Windows host. So you can just go straight into issuing PowerShell commands from the command line, say Bolt uh, command run, give it your one-liner in PowerShell, specify your targets, and you're off to the races. Uh, with scripts, this is a really easy way to say, you know, if you have a PowerShell script today, there, there's absolutely nothing that you need to do to get that to run against these targets. We can say script run, there's the file, there's the targets. Uh, scripts can be any language of your choice. So uh, we default to talking in, in PowerShell here, for examples today, but if you're working with Python or, or Ruby or um, you know, anything else, as long as that remote system knows how to execute, then it can be whatever language you want. Uh, tasks. So this is essentially taking that script and putting some additional metadata on top of it. So uh, gives you the ability to do things like input validation and you know put descriptions in there. So uh, I just remember being handed scripts before to make things happen without really knowing what was happening. It was just run it and <laughs> it will work. So we have ways here that we can document these scripts when we share with other people so they actually know what the expectations are to make this work. Uh, and then in plans, uh, so this is really if we're looking for step-based workflows, something where we want to you know, go iteratively down and, and uh, take care of everything. So those can be literally everything above uh, or additional plans or puppet code. So this is like the kitchen sink scenario. We can throw everything into a plan, uh, list out the order of it, and, and fire away. Now, there are other commands in there, like you can use a, a bolt apply to actually run a, a puppet manifest. Uh, there's file commands for uploading and downloading files. Uh, we're gonna focus today on you know, these core pieces here. If you want that full list, it's bolt dash dash help, and it will show you all the various things you can do. So let's move on to the first exercise. Uh, if you do not have Bolt available, you, we'll walk through how to install it. Otherwise, uh, this might be pretty quick if you already have Bolt on there. So it's available as a tool for Windows, Mac, or Linux. Uh, there is also a Docker image. Um, this is really nice if you are doing something more in like CI, CD space and just want to grab a container and run something. Uh, it is also inside Azure Cloud Shell. So if you open either the Bash or the PowerShell variant, you'll see Bolt at the command line. It's something you can start using immediately. 
Uh, for installation details, you can go to puppet.com slash docs bolt and then click on the installing bolts and it'll give you a whole bunch of links. Um, so what we'll do is we'll go through, there's the link for installing. Uh, and when you're done, you should be able to open a shell, just do bolt dash dash version. Just make sure uh, if you already have bolts on your system, we want to be at at least 2.23.0 or ahead of that. Um, so I'm going to put uh, five minutes on the clock and check back in. We may go 10 if people are still having issues. But uh, as I yell out, hey, does anybody still need time? Please use the chat or the Q&A to, to let me know that you need more time uh, so that we can <laughs> give it to you. All right. I will give you some time. Uh, and as uh, Jeff had mentioned in the chat here, so this would be bolt on your uh, laptop. We do want it, it can be, if you have another system that you use locally, it can be on there. It's just, we are going to be using the WinRM transport to reach out to those systems on the spreadsheet. So you'll want a, a host system that you can aim at the target with. Uh, also, after you install, if you're doing this from PowerShell, you know, you, you can do a, um, if you have Chocolaty, it's just Chocolaty install puppet-bolt. Um, in either case, if it's the MSI, if it's uh, the Chocolaty package, I do recommend closing and reopening the PowerShell window just to, to make sure it refreshes everything correctly. Again, if you need any help, have any questions, uh, feel free to throw them in the chat. It uh, looks like we've also added a few people over the uh, course of the first section here. So if you're coming in new and, and, and catching up, uh, you'll notice in the chat at the top, there's a sticky note that will take you to a, uh, a Google Doc page that has a list of servers. Just go throw your name in one of the blank spots, and that'll be the, the server you use today for, for executing uh, tasks with Bolt. And then we're on the first exercise here where we're just going to uh, make sure Bolt's installed on a laptop or a machine that you can use here locally and uh, making sure that your version number is above 2.23.0. So we have about uh, three minutes here before uh, I'll check in again.
Okay, about uh, one more minute. If you do need more time, uh, use the, the chat and, and let us know, and we will extend that a bit. Okay, I see no argument, so I'm going to move on to the next section. So let's talk about uh, bulk content and how we organize. So this is a, a really important aspect of it. We have scripts, commands, tasks, plans. There's going to be a variety of things that resolve you know, automation for a particular problem. So how do we organize that? Uh, so there's two different paths currently for how we do this, and it really depends on uh, you know how much you use Puppet today, if you use Puppet Enterprise today, uh, and if you're intending on using it as part of Puppet Enterprise. Uh, so this is that that model that I'll talk to. We're actually going to use the project model on the next slide. I'll go over that, but um, this allows you to say. Uh, put your puppet manifest and then any of your bolt tasks and plans together into a single module. So whereas if you're, you're familiar with the puppet folder structure and you put your, your manifest in the manifest folder, we'd simply put plans in the plans folder, tasks in the task folder. Uh, in Puppet Enterprise, it only starts recognizing anything from bolt at the task or plan level. On the plus side, uh, simply throwing a script into that task folder registers it as a task. So there's a very simple way to get, you know, anything that you may have today or any scripts that you're writing just uh, into that Puppet Enterprise framework where you have the access control and the, the centralized execution. Um, so the, the one thing to keep in mind here, it, it uses that same workflow. So again, this is great if you're develop, developing for Puppet today and you just want to add these extra pieces that you can you know, run ad hoc with it. Um, it uses all the same development workflow. It uses the Puppet file in that control repository. So you would list out all the modules that you're going to be using uh, alongside this, this module, and that's how all those dependencies are met. Uh, so the other method that we'll be working in today is the Bolt project. And this is really uh, the ability to take everything, shove it into uh, you know, one project that can be shipped to people. So all the dependencies, everything should be able to work straight out of the box right here. Um, so there are some built-ins that come with bolts that are, are things like the, uh, you know, running service tasks, uh, managing packages, pulling facts from systems, and then we can add additional content from there. Uh, so the Puppet the Puppet Forge is available to us. Like I said, we can use that Puppet code in our plans. Uh, so this this really becomes a conversation or, or decision you get to make where, depending on what you're familiar with and what you're trying to accomplish, you know, if I had to, you know, say build a web server, we're going to do this today, and a lot of it is there. For example, I know if you told me to build one today, I know I can grab you know, two puppet modules, and I can use that code that already exists and just input the parameters I need to build a web server for you. It's a very simple process to grab that from the forge because somebody's already done all that work and put it in the community forge for us to, to absorb and use. Um, if it's something where I'm, I might have a script that I already use today and I just want to bring that into some type of organized management, that can come straight into that Bolt project. Or say if I'm really trying to, to crack something weird here where it's going to be a lot of manual work for now, but you know, we're essentially writing a, a script that's the documentation for how we solve for that problem, that's something where we would also bring in and, and put somewhere along in the, uh, the scripts with the task mode. 
Um, so these are standalone. Again, they ship with all the dependencies involved. So this is a great way to, to move, say, a single project around a, a solution or technology that you're working with across to other teams. Now, they're de decentralized from that traditional Puppet infrastructure. So uh, whereas if I was on Puppet Enterprise, I would write code, I would push that code in, and then it's available to everyone. Here, you're still working with, uh, say, pushing it up to, to your version control system and having other people be able to download it. Um, this gets a little more interesting if you've been you know, watching throughout the day the announcement of Puppet Connect. That's really one of the things that addresses there is being able to take these projects and use projects, which are, again, fully baked. So they have everything inside, but be able to have a centralized location where we can now share those across teams as well. Uh, so for the rest of these exercises, we're actually going to download a project. It's going to have some Puppet modules. It'll have some tasks, plans, and things available to you there. And we're going to spend our time working through that. So uh, pretty simple here. We want to go and either clone or download that project. Uh, the address is right there. It's github.com slash puppet lab slash workshop dash bolt dash windows. Uh, put that in a directory wherever you want to, we would want to rename that to Bolt Shop. Um, and then in whatever shell you're using, go into the directory and run a Bolt task show. Uh, you should have some tasks that actually, that's not uh, that's a typo, that should actually be uh, uh, Bolt Shop that it should stay there. So you should see uh, running Bolt task show, you should see Bolt Shop listed. So I'll go ahead and uh, give everybody about five minutes and check back in. Uh, if you look, Stephen Potter has posted that link into the room. So you should be able to just click there to get to it. And if you run into any issues, just let us know.
All right, we got a couple of more minutes before we move ahead. Uh, if you do have any issues, let us know in the chat. Uh, once again, there is a typo there. I wish I could find there was a nice thing where I could just draw on the screen, but instead of them starting with compliance, they're going to start with bolt shop. That's why you don't give people right access to your slide decks. All right, we're wrapping up here. Uh, so the one note at the bottom that uh, we have seen some, I'll just say weirdness. Uh, if you're in PowerShell, since Windows tends to not necessarily respect case sensitivity and Bolt uh, likes to do that when pathing for tasks. Uh, if you're say in a code directory that should be a capital C and you're in the lower C, you may run into issues when you do that Bolt task show. Uh, where it's not, they're not going to actually show up. You may actually see a warning message saying that it's detecting the case sensitivity problem and, and you can just literally CD to the same directory with the right case and, and it will resolve that. Um, so if you do run into that, that's the fix. If not, we'll go ahead and move ahead. Uh, I'd like to also, so you've seen in there, uh, I forgot to mention him at the top, so now I feel bad, but the uh, sensational solutions engineer, the the king of Columbus, Mr. Jeff Bistone is also joining us today. Take a bow. So we'll review. Um, what did you just do? You downloaded a Bolt project, so congratulations. You can now automate. You could literally take that today and just go, uh, I wouldn't advise running it against everything in your infrastructure, but from, from this point on, that project can be used elsewhere. And that's one of the cool things about Bolt, right? I now have all the dependencies, all the batteries included. Doesn't matter if I'm pointing that at, at Windows and AWS. It doesn't matter if I point it in my home lab here or uh, just find some random server that has WinRM open on the internet, we can make a web server. Um, so. Like I said, feel free to try this at home. So let's dig into the projects and uh, see what we got here. This, this is the file structure we're gonna be looking at today. So uh, the, the big thing here, there, there's going to be YAML. Everybody likes YAML. Um, I think everybody likes YAML. There's, there's strong opinions each way. So bolt-project.yaml. This is where we're going to put our project specific metadata. So the name, um, we can actually whitelist and blacklist tasks. So if you have some private ones that you don't want exposed from like the bolt task show, uh, you can do that here. Uh, the inventory.yaml, that's where we're going to list out all of our systems. So again, this is something that if we're shipping that project, let's say you have a group of servers specific to an application that all these tasks will apply to, we can pre-populate that inventory. Um, I, I would highly suggest not putting passwords in there, but if you have you know, keys on your system you're using, you can do that. There's also ways of encrypting that, that data if you do need to ship passwords. Um, it can also be a dynamic list. So we're gonna work with static today because frankly, it's a, a lot easier to work with in a workshop format. Uh, dynamic list can use something like, uh, we have modules for, the uh, the like AWS, Azure, and uh, even one for Terraform. So like in my home lab environment, I have Terraform building machines and VMware, and I can actually grab the uh, the info out of the state file 
and start say like grab all my VMware instances and start running additional tasks on it. Same way with AWS, I actually build the same way. I just pick Azure AWS or VMware and it can go through and look at that state file and pull out what those instance types are and then just go and run the additional tasks. Uh, so that's a workflow for me when I provision something is build in VMware as the first step of my bolt plan uh, with a Terraform apply and then connect to Puppet Agent, you know, do a couple other things with uh, with PowerShell and then I'm, I'm done on the Windows side. Uh, Puppet file. So this is a list of all the, the Puppet modules that we're going to use. So again, the, uh, you know, we will have dependencies. In this case, we're going to build a web server out. So we'll have uh, an IIS server um, or module we're going to use from the Forge. Uh, and so we would list out the modules we want to use from the Forge inside that Puppet file and then we can resolve those dependencies all inside the project. Um, so it can be shipped one of two ways. For today's purposes, I've put everything in there. I've already resolved all the dependencies. If you have a lot of modules coming in and it, you know, it's gonna be a big chunky project to ship around, you can always just say, hey, the first thing you do is, is run the puppet file install to resolve those and keep them local to the project. Uh, so the people are only downloading all that information when they actually need it. Uh, the modules directory, so this is where all of those modules from the Forge are going to come in. And then task plans files, so these are the, this is the folder structure for where we put tasks, plans, and files. Uh, in the case of today, we have a couple of tasks we're going to work through, we have a couple of plans, and then we actually have uh, some very poor content I grabbed for the, uh, the actual web server content that we just shoved in the file directory here. So walking through uh, this is what the Bolt project YAML looks like. Again, we have the name, we have the where the inventory file is stored, and then we can set the module path. So by default, we're using modules, but say we have different places we want to look, or we have a centralized location on the server that we're using Bolt on to look, we can throw that all in here. Uh, inventory YAML looks like this. We have uh, groups, and then we just make groups that make sense to us. In the case of today, uh, you know, typically if we're running uh, in a, a full Bolt workshop for Windows and Linux, you'll have a Windows and a Linux group. So we just chopped out the Linux part today. Um, then we can list targets that have both the address for the target as well as an alias. So as I was talking about before, if I have to write Bolt shop 99classroom like I'm, I'm already tired of that. WWW, we're done. Uh, then for those groups, we can supply the the transport information, any other configuration information is how we connect. So again, I, I advise scrambling that password <laughs> or uh, encrypting it. Um, the, the point being, this is where we can store that information. We can set things like on WinRM here, we're just going to connect over the HTTP port today. So we'll disable SSL. Uh, again, that inventory, static or dynamic. So here's some options where we can use uh, Terraform or Azure inventory or AWS inventory. When it comes to Azure or uh, Azure or AWS, it's actually going to connect to the APIs uh, at those services and then allow you to pull things. So if you need to start searching for uh, certain tags around uh, you know, any virtual machine asset you're connecting to there, uh, that, that's how you would mine that information and then print that out as a dynamic inventory. So let's uh, work on managing that inventory file for the next step. Uh, so we're going to open up the code editor of your choice. Any example here is, is VS Code. Um, and we're going to edit that inventory file. Why? Well, we need to do one thing here. Uh, that that URI that says Bolt Shop 99, that, that's not your server. Um, so the one more last reminder here, the sticky notes at the top, if you haven't done it yet, uh, at the top of the chat. But you uh, can click that link, go to the document, find the name of your server. That's what you're going to do here. You're just going to simply replace that URI field with the name of your server, uh, save that information. The, the credentials, if they're not in there, it's administrator, puppet labs, the capital P and an exclamation point because we're serious. And then uh, save that and from the shell run bolt inventory show dash dash targets windows. And it will go ahead and show you that your, your system is now there and available. 
Uh, so you'll see I can interchange here. It's if you like the the double dash way of specifying parameters, dash dash targets. If you want the shorthand, it's just dash t. Again, bolt with uh, uh, bolt dash dash help or dash h. You can get a list of those. Uh, see all the different parameters available to you. Um, one of the big things you'll see here is we're actually, you know, by putting this stuff inside the inventory file, like the configuration information, we don't have to do this on the command line. Uh, if, if you've taken one of the earlier Bolt workshops, you, you may have gone through that pain, but it's literally saying, I want to run a, uh, a Bolt task against this host name with these credentials, and these are the WinRM settings. We're not doing that anymore. It's all supplied right here in the inventory, so we don't need to go back and, and put those things in on the command line. Um, so I'm gonna give about uh, uh, nine minutes here. So it should take us to, to 10 minutes till the hour. And uh, again, if you have questions, throw it in the chat. Otherwise, I will check in in a few. So the one thing uh, I will tell you here is as you're wrapping up editing the, the inventory.yaml uh, and running this command, you may very well see a, a WinRM timeout. Uh, and that can be you know, several different things. If you do see it, definitely let us know and we'll walk through a couple things here. Uh, it could be as simple as the, the host name being wrong. It could be as simple as WinRM taking too long uh, to respond. And so we'll just have to run that command another time.
Okay, we got about five minutes remaining here. Again, if you're having any issues, let us know. Uh, also, if you don't have a machine yet or, or you'd like to grab one and, and uh, play with Bolt here, you can go ahead and click on that sticky note in the chat section to access the sheet to sign up for one. Any other questions, please direct into the chat of the Q&A and we'll respond. Uh, we got about a uh, little under three minutes left here, so make sure you can get connected and throw any questions in the chat. All right, we're coming up on time. So one thing I'll, I'll throw in here before uh, I move forward. Uh, if you do look at that project you downloaded, there is going to be an actual uh, uh, exercises folder. So if you do get caught behind here and, and want to want to take a deeper look at it or you know, if something happens, you need to take a look at this later. You do have the ability to go in there and actually get the these steps from the exercises inside of the project. They're in a, a markdown format. Um, so you can either go to GitHub and see them rendered or just you know text from the command line should be fine. That being said, let's review what we just did. 
Um, so within that inventory file, we can manage groups for our servers and our connection information. Um, we can either add that inventory statically, which is what we did, or we can do it dynamically by grabbing content from the Puppet Forge that allows us to do Terraform, Azure, AWS. Um, there's also the capability there in the in the Bolt documentation. It walks through a bit how to create your own uh, custom plugins. So if you do have uh, something outside of these three listed here that you'd like to interact with, there is a, a way to easily be able to, to plug that in and parse that information into an inventory file. Um, you can also configure your Bolt settings to connect directly to Puppet Enterprise. And then you have you know, the ultimate inventory list there of anything connected to Puppet. So we can start doing things like using PuppetDB to query things based on fact results to find the right systems we need to run a task against. So hopefully everybody was able to run through that. They are able to, uh, to see their inventory in there. And at this point, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, so get up, stretch out a little bit, grab a drink. Uh, we'll be back in five minutes. So I have... Well, I'm in Central, it's 4.52, so let's say at 57, we'll come back and start breaking stuff. All right.
All right, we've hit the end of the break timer. So uh, with that, let's start blowing some things up, shall we? That didn't sound exciting enough. <laughs> uh, so let's start with commands and scripts. These are the you know lowest level of things we can do with Bolt here. But sometimes that's all you need to do, right, is take a one-liner and throw it out to a bunch of things and, and get something done. So <clears throat> commands will default to PowerShell or into whatever default shell of the user when you're connecting on a Linux system. Um, this is something where it's it's fairly, I don't know, this is logical to me as you start building out a, a solution to something is if I can do it on one line, great. If it's like this long PowerShell with a bunch of semicolons and I'm like, just if it's too much, throw it in a script, right? We can do multiple lines there. We can do parameters with inputs and things like that and, and make this uh, a little more useful at that point, a little more flexible. Um, so the, the command, simple enough. Uh, I, I tend to try to keep that to one line. If it's more than that, I can throw it in a script. Typically, again, if you're working in a project, you're going to be building things that other people will consume. So the command doesn't make as much sense. Uh, but it is nice to have from the standpoint that, like, say, if I just want to run one thing across all these systems, say today, you know, I stood up the, the lab environment here. I have 50 Windows machines that we can play with today. I wanted to make sure that they could all respond. So just doing a bolt command host name across 50 hosts. I can go out and execute that and actually get a response from each one uh, that they are alive and well and actually giving me some output. So when you move into scripts, you can actually uh, pass arguments in if they're, you know, if it knows what to do with them inside the script. Uh, one of the bigger differences here as we move from a script into a bolt task within a you know exercise or two is between those two, the the scripts doesn't necessarily validate the argument. Um, when we get to a task, we can start saying like, I require an IP address and I can put in regex validation or I can enforce it to be a string or a list of options. Uh, so we can, you know, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later on, but the idea is here, as you start thinking about sharing something, uh, you know, that first step is normally we threw everything into a folder and put that into Git. And so now we're sharing our scripts. But now we're, we're iterating on that process and we're adding some documentation to make that easier for other people on the team to read what it is they're actually doing by running this script and what, you know, what inputs need to be satisfied for it to succeed. So the syntax, uh, this is the pain I was talking about earlier that we have solved with inventory. But you can see it's bolt. It's whatever uh, type of action we're, we're doing here. So the command, script, task, or plan. We can run or, or show. And then the name of it, the targets, and any additional options. So if we were just going to do a write host or write output, if you want to give me style guide issues, uh, bolt command run write host hello world. This is our list of targets. This is our username. This is our password, real secure on the command line. This is the transport, and let's not use SSL either. Uh, similar to an SSH host, this is precisely why we want to use an inventory file because uh, there's no point in, and it's it's not easy if we're writing this on the command line every single time we want to do something. Uh, so making some logical groupings where we can put our connection info somewhere, our list of hosts somewhere, and then just refer to it by a simple name definitely lets us uh, work a lot smarter. So let's move into the next exercise where we're going to now execute commands and execute scripts. Uh, so we'll go ahead and start with the hello world. So just bolt command run, write output hello world and target the machine. Now, remember from the inventory file, we have multiple ways of addressing this machine. Uh, I can say target windows and anything under that group name of windows is gonna run. And we only have one system there. Uh, that system has that long host name that's at the classroom.puppet.com. It also has that alias. So you could just as easily say target www instead of Windows. Uh, save yourself four characters and run the exact same thing. So we'll go ahead and run that command. Uh, right output hello world. We can then also run a script. If you look in the examples folder, there's a hello world PS1. Uh, that is literally, yeah, you 
copy and, and paste from your command line into your uh, into a PowerShell file, and now we have a script we can start sharing. Uh, so I'll put another five minutes on the board here and uh, check in to see if you guys uh, are having any issues, need any help, throw them in the chat. Uh, otherwise, we'll continue then. All right, we are uh, got about three minutes left here. So again, if you're having issues, throw them in the chat. Otherwise, we'll continue then. All right, we're coming up on time. Uh, so again, if you need some additional time here, you can always check the exercises folder uh, in the project for the steps through it here. And if you're having any issues and need some support, our, our moderators are standing by in the chat room to help you with that. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on to the next bit. Well, let's do some review here. Uh, 
you ran a command and a script. So if you haven't automated before, you have now. Uh, get yourself on LinkedIn. The uh, We used WinRM as our transport. Uh, SSH is used typically on the Linux side. We can use Puppet Agent. Um, I said before, like I play around with stuff on, on the Docker socket now and then as well. Um, so we do have a lot of different capabilities here, uh, as well as setting those, you know, hopefully secure, but if not insecure options based on your environment. Uh, I, I speak to this as, as I, I talk to more and more people that use Bolt. Um, one of the things that tended to hold them back was that depending on the type of environment you're in, I know I've worked in some where it's, you know, basically uh, Active Directory infrastructure from like 20 different acquisitions. So doing something like rolling out WinRM in a way that can easily be harnessed uh, tends to not be happening. Uh, in those situations, you can actually uh, use the Puppet Agent. So uh, if you do have firewall rules or anything against it, that's also a good reason where if you have exceptions for using Puppet Enterprise already, it's it's just there, it uses it, it works the same way. Um, I tend to like that. The other thing I gravitate towards if it's available is you know open SSH on Windows, as crazy as it sounds. Uh, I just find the, the protocol for doing stuff like this a lot a lot friendlier. Um, so you do have options if WinRM isn't available to you there. Uh, but you know, traditional environment, if you have the ability to get that WinRM stuff set up, rolled out correctly, uh, should work fine. Uh, so what aren't we doing here? We're using commands and scripts in the previous example, but we haven't really looked at tasks and plans. And that that's really where Bolt starts doing some of the uh, some of the cooler things here. Uh, you know, the, the big question is, are, are scripts and commands enough? I, I've met a ton of people that are perfectly happy uh, automating a, a list of commands or, or, or a couple of scripts and just literally, you know, saying run one, two, and three, and let's be done. And to me, when when we talk about that, the question is, is, is that right for you? I'm, I'm not going to tell you it's wrong. Uh, it, it may work just fine for you. The, the, the biggest thing is solving your automation problems, right? Uh, maybe that's literally getting what you do as a manual process today just into some type of automation framework. Uh, and again, that ability to say copy a script into the task folder for uh, for Bolt, and now we can put it into Puppet Enterprise and assign access controls and all these kinds of things on on what's just a a simple PowerShell script for you know whatever you needed to do. Like that is a, a great way to get started. We can at least start sharing and get people consistently using the same way of doing it. Um, you know, if if you're starting to share across teams, the the other thing I've seen in talking to a lot of, of customers and uh, you know, I, I come from Windows teams where I you know I have been the person just clicking like next on everything and going through the wizards. I have been the person writing all the code to automate that process, and I've been at every stage in between. Uh, and we don't want to sit here and say, like, well, the people scripting are definitely the right people, and the people clicking next aren't. No, it's, that's not the goal of this. The goal is really to find a, a common way that we can all get the same thing done. We're trying to standardize on how we're doing something here. Uh, and then we can extend the automation or mature it from there. So the ability to take something today, move that into a, a script, uh, or you know even up to these tasks and plans we'll go over, uh, throw some documentation on it and share it with other people so that regardless of where you're at in that spectrum, you at least know like I need to run X to perform this task in my job. And here's the, the fields that it needs here. You, know, you don't need to know how PowerShell works. The, the person that's really good at writing the PowerShell can go ahead and, and work that part out, but you can still consume that and execute that and get the job done. Uh, so there's a, a great way to start consolidating effort there and to start really standardize and let everybody uh, able to start automating. So let's move up to tasks. Scripts into tasks, yeah. the. Uh, the ability here to, to really make that script more useful um, by, by converting it from a script into a task. What, you know, what do we mean by useful? We'll, we'll cover that in a minute. 
any script file, I've, I've said this before, but any script file that goes in that task directory immediately is recognized as a task. It's then what you want to build on top of it to make it more usable by others. That that really is uh, you know where it gets its its extra powers. Uh, the parameters in Bolt pass through to your param block and PowerShell. So as long as you have a param block at the top, it can replicate the same fields you're putting into this metadata to turn it into a task. And it's just a one-to-one -one pass through. And then if you're familiar with how uh, puppet namespacing works, this is going to be very similar. The idea that you know this PowerShell file thrown in a task folder is now referred to by the name of the, the module or project you're working in, and then the name of the actual file that's running here. So it, it figures tasks are going to be tasks. That makes it executable as a bolt task. But you're going to actually see these two things put the name together. So Again, here, AWS show BPC is AWS colon colon show BPC, uh, MySQL and SQL there. And then, you know, this is puppet magic, I guess, but the, the idea of having an init file, you can have that and just it, use the, the first naming for it here. So using yum instead of having separation. I don't see a lot of this used in bulk context, but it's definitely possible. So, more useful. Uh, these are the things, the descriptive text. We can define what that task does, what the parameters are, what they do. So we can have descriptions at a parameter level, and then the type of input that's needed there. So we can actually validate and enforce uh, essentially anything from the, like that you can enforce in the puppet language as far as strings, arrays, enums, um, you know, you can do regex searching, like that That kind of stuff can all be done uh, at the input validation level. Uh, you can make them cross-platform. So that'll be outside the scope of today, but we could actually say, um, you know, the implementation details, if this runs on a system that is detected as Linux, should be to run this shell script. Whereas if it's on Windows, it should run this PowerShell script. And then, uh, from there, once we have that JSON on there, it shows up in Puppet Enterprise. And in the GUI inside of Puppet Enterprise, you'll actually have like drop down boxes. So again, if we're centralizing the way that we want people to use it, regardless of their experience with scripting and coding and, and all this stuff, you know, if we put the extra work in to define a few things for them, they can go to a console. They can actually read all of this metadata very you know clearly on the page. And then, like, if you give a list of options, there's a drop down where they can pick the right one. Uh, they'll see all of the required parameters and the ability to add the optional ones. Uh, so it makes it really easy for somebody to come in, take advantage of all this great automation work you've done without really having to know much about it. They can read through and determine uh, what it needs to be successful. Um, so, again, feel like I hammer in this home here. <laughs> uh, what is a task? So again, it can be a script in the language of your choice. Uh, we stick to PowerShell today, but anything where the remote system knows how to handle it, uh, you can fire off to those systems. So uh, you know, the ones that I see are either Bash, Python, Ruby, or, or, Win or PowerShell, sorry. Um, the additional metadata is going to have a description for the task and the parameters. Any optional parameters are required, and then the type of input that's required, and then those additional implementation details like the script per OS. Um, there's also helpers, I think, for Python and Ruby that can be you know, called to in this as well. And then uh, anything that's a task has to live in that task folder. It's going to auto search for them there, so they will need to be placed in there. And you can, yeah, and it, it keeps the same extension. So like the script.ps1 in a task folder recognized as that task. So let's start playing with them. We'll do a bolt task show, and you should see available tasks. Uh, we're going to see that you know we've gone way too far maturing Hello World into uh, building a task we can run here. So bolt task run, bolt shop, Hello World. Uh, and we can target that dub, 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 and we should go ahead and, and just kick out hello world. Now, when you do the show, you'll see we also have parameters here. I've added an optional parameter to add a string. So if you look at the PowerShell script, it's uh, you know a clunky way of saying, hey, if we have a name, let's say, you know, hi, Pete. If we don't, let's just say hello world. 
So uh, that's how we input that parameter on the command line is we just say we want to run this against www and then the name parameter should be whatever name you enter. So we'll try both of these and make sure we get a return that uh, matches our expectations. Uh, I'll put five minutes on the board here and check in about halfway through. Any problems, throw them in the chat. Thanks. All right, just checking in here. If you're uh, running into issues, use the chat. Otherwise, uh, we got about two, three minutes left and we'll move on to the next portion. Okay, I'll give you about another minute here. Uh, if you have, again, many questions, let us know.
Okay, let's go ahead and move on. If you uh, if you need a little more time on this, you can go into the exercises folder of the projects, and uh, we're on exercise five for executing a task. So let's review uh, tasks. So it offers descriptions for that task itself, and then any additional parameters. So we're effectively documenting what our script does and the fields it needs to operate. And then as we share with other people, they can read and understand what it is and, and what they need to give it. Uh, it has that metadata that allows you to do input validation and also pass other runtime requirements. So if we need a helper, if we need to find, you know, Python 3 versus 2, some, you know, we can specify those things as part of that manifest. Uh, it's all in, in JSON, so uh, if, you, if you didn't think you were doing the DevOps before, we've touched YAML, we've just JSON. So far today, you're, you're about to get a hat trick, but I, I won't make you work on XML, I promise. Um, so that metadata is really what, what gives it its power as a task. As much as moving a script over just makes it accessible as one, adding that little bit of JSON on top of it is really what allows you to uh, I think makes it a simpler and more elegant way to share that with other people. And that may be something as you look at maturing automation, you know, you could be at a point where right now we just need to take what we have, throw it into to tasks. Um, so we can execute it centrally or, or, you know, work with this common workflow. But at that point, it's, you know, how can we give more people access to this? And, and one of the great ways to, to build that bridge is, having the documentation in the script there so they actually know what it is and how to use it. Um, the parameters map to that param block. You can override that and specify uh, just a hash that comes in through standard in. Uh, on the Linux side, these are all going to be environment variables that you pass in the script. Uh, I believe they're like pt underscore and then whatever the name of the, the parameter is. Uh, so looking at that metadata, this is in that project, but just to get a little screenshot here, uh, we have you know a description. We want to do install or remove a Windows feature, uh, the parameters. So we want the name of the feature, that's a string, and we want an action, which is to install or uninstall. Uh, now, this always poses a great question for me as I, was, I kind of wrote it as an example where it's something that I wouldn't do, but I did anyways. <laughs> Uh, and that's the idea of I want to install a Windows feature here. So we have you know two methods that already exist right now that we can automate. One is a simple PowerShell, you know, install Windows feature name of feature. And then on the flip side of that, we have a puppet module for Windows feature that we could also use to to set these up, or we could just list out all the features we want for the server, have it apply those, and it will manage the state of those features. So writing a script that does like one tiny aspect of installing or uninstalling uh, could be a, a silly way of handling it. It could be completely valid at that point, depending on if we want to, you know, maybe add some things here over what features they're able to install or uninstall, or or abstract that into the name of what type of you know package they're installing for. If you have a couple of different type of you know web servers or, or middleware server, and you want to be able to specify that and have it know what features to install. So the options are there. The, the, the question you have to start asking as you build these kinds of things out, if you're new to automation, is you know, how do I want to automate this problem? I, I want to make this easy for everybody. I want to make it so I'm not reinventing the wheel. And that's where you know, things like the Puppet Forge really come in handy, is that a lot of this like base level Windows stuff is just already there for the taking. And so we can just tap into that use all the, the the work that's been done before and, and just kind of accelerate our way into automating some of these issues away. So this is you know essentially looking at this this Windows feature task that's in your project. Uh, we can look at that script and we can think about you know reusing it across teams. The the, the first thing I did was to define an action. So just we want to add or remove it. So that's the simple thing we're giving people is not sub features or anything right now. It's just literally, if you need to quickly install something, you can do it without having to know the the, the PowerShell for it. Uh, you do need to know the name of the feature. So that's uh, another thing where uh, they have to have that information handy. But as I was talking, you can abstract that to say, like, here's a list of features we plug in or we allow. And they could drop down and just pick that. Uh, 
So as I said, this pushes that boundary of like maybe it's easier to use Puppet or you know, Puppet integrates into PowerShell DSC. So all these DSC resources are also available as part of that Puppet code. I can run any of these as the solutions. So what's the, the best way to get it there is definitely something you want to evaluate as you start uh, solving for any, for any issues that you have. Uh, so let's go ahead and run that task. Uh, I have here, you just open the shell, go into that directory, run the task show for the bolt shop windows feature and we should see um you know the name of it we should see the the various parameters here for the action feature so we'll run bolt task run bolt shop windows feature target that system action equals install and the feature is web dash web server so if we execute that at the end of it, we'll see that the feedback from PowerShell that that feature has been installed. You should be able to then go into a web browser to HTTP and the address of your lab system, and you'll see that default IIS message. So I'll give uh, about five minutes here. I'll check in halfway through. Again, any troubleshooting uh, help, just throw that into the chat and we got people standing by, thanks. All right, we're around the halfway point, so a couple more minutes.
All right, about another minute here. Okay, so if everything's been done right here, you are uh, looking at that that wonderful IIS landing page that comes with enabling the web server service. And uh, so now we have a web server. It's not much, but we're able to execute a single command, stand that thing up. We could literally point that to, well, I wouldn't suggest a thousand machines, but let's maybe do 10 at a time and stand up multiple web servers. Uh, the important part being we're doing it in a consistent, repeatable manner here. And while as right now that's just a Windows feature, as we start looking more at that complexity, you know, if you're new to, to working with something like Puppet and you're thinking about, hey, what, what should be like the corporate standard for my web server? What are all the components of that? Um, you know, we can build that all into a task or we can, you know, put it into multiple steps in a plan, which we'll start going over shortly. And we can actually, uh, you know, start to standardize all those various steps into one simple workflow where we just fire this from the command line, fire it from the, the Puppet console, and we can have that end result. So we can review. This was a task, script plus metadata. So uh, task plus, I guess I call that versus the normal script method, uh, which is basically we added some fields that we could pass through to the script and then take action based on it. So um, we can think here, again, thinking to that, you know, why make this particular task? We have other options. We have PowerShell that we can use. We have a Puppet module that we could also use. The question is, you know, you're know, you gonna have a bunch of additional parameters. You're gonna wanna standardize what it means to be a web server for your organization or for your particular needs. Uh, how can we roll all that in and, and really abstract that difficulty so uh, any person can, can consume this and execute it and still get that result? Um, so as in bullet three there, it's a, a good case for reason, either explicitly going to the PowerShell route and maybe throwing all those options in, uh, or if we don't want to you know, write the one-to-one -one or we want to have more flexibility than just a, a script, uh, we would look at something like desired state. Uh, desired state, I mean, it really depends on where you are. If you are using Puppet, desired state is something that's going to be enforced every 30 minutes. And that, that brings another layer to this is that you know, is standing up a web server the important part or is ensuring that the web server feature is, is always there? Uh, you look at something like installing the web server feature and that's such like weirdly low hanging fruit of building an IIS web server that you would think you'd only have to install that once and never come back to it. But if you do need that enforcement every 30 minutes, that's where we start thinking more into Puppet code uh, and using Puppet in particular to apply it. Uh, so you know, to that point, you ran the single task to install the feature. The web server will involve more steps than just turning that on. Uh, so that's where this step-based approach comes in. We have multiple steps. What do we do to address that? And boom, plans. So plans are step-based orchestration. In, in short, we're telling it to do this, then do that. Um, now we can mix and match. It's really, we can assemble things as needed to complete whatever we need to complete and solve. Uh, that can be commands, scripts, tasks, other plans, puppet code, could probably get a kitchen sink in there somewhere. Um, but we can put these in whatever order we need them to be in. We can capture the output from the first command and feed that into the next command. Uh, and we can evaluate things per step. Uh, we can specify different targets. So if you look at that model, let's say maybe I have to modify a load balancer to take a system out, run some updates on it, bring it back into the load balancer. That's something where we can say, when RM connects to, to the Windows server for the first step or, or connects over SSH into a load balancer, uh, does whatever it needs to do, and we can put those in place. Now, we have the ability to use either YAML or the Puppet language. So. I, uh, I'm kind of fond of using the, the YAML pieces right now as, as a lot of the initial bolt work I did was, you know, the, fir the first thing I looked at was 
20 years of being a sysadmin and, and the, the little like folder of scripts I've kept with me throughout time, like it, it took me half a day to make those work inside of Bolt. And that's something where, well, if I have like three scripts I would run to get something done, I could just in YAML, right? Like run script one, then script two, then script three. Very easy to do. Anybody can pick up YAML right away as long as they can you know, hit spacebar a couple of times, we can get something done. Puppet language is when I started working at things saying like, uh, yeah, I wrote a module to export group policy into puppet code. Well, first thing I wanna do is I wanna actually reach out to that domain controller and I wanna export that information, bring back all this, this, you know, this PowerShell object I've converted to JSON. Well, for that, I'm using like the output of that gets stored in a variable. That variable gets assessed and we start going through that and pulling out fields to map into puppet code. That's a little more advanced. And that's something where, you know, you'll see depending on people's level of, of comfort in YAML, like you can do a lot of things in YAML. The question is, should you? Is is a data structure a programming language? And that's that's an entirely different thing meant for a lot of YouTube feuds or something. But the idea being YAML, if you want to start simple and you can get pretty far with that, if you do need to do more deep dive into the results coming back, uh, if you want to start using more of the context and functions and things that are in that puppet language, you can just as easily start working to it. And it's also built so that if you start in YAML and you're like, okay, I need to, to store these things and work with them in, in a more like puppety way, we can simply run a bolt convert on the YAML plan and it will swap that over to being puppet code. So for today, we're gonna to use YAML, but just know that like if YAML is not your thing or if you're familiar with puppet code and wanna work there, or if you do start pushing the, the edge of what you're comfortable in in YAML, uh, there is the entire you know, language there at your fingertips. So kind of walking through the web server plan here. Um, I feel like I'm not even gonna repeat bullet one at this point, <laughs> I've said it enough times. Uh, I've said most of these enough times, but the idea here, if we start looking at what we're doing, we have parameters, we have a description at the top, this is gonna deploy the IIS site and the base configuration. We have parameters that, you know, target spec is a type of, uh, it's basically the object with all the connection information for your system. And, uh, then we have steps and it's just as easy as we list the step, we can list a description and, and the targets we wanna hit with it. Um, targets can be, you know, again, mixed and matched. So if we have to split this between front end, back end servers, anything like that, we're fully capable of doing that here. So we have plan slash build web server dot YAML that's in your text editor. Um, and you'll see all the various things happening here. It's gonna be a combination of commands that are being run, of uh, we're gonna upload some files that are in our file directory. So we're gonna mix and match the types of things we're gonna do. We're only gonna have one target here, but you can see where we could you know, move this across multiple servers, or maybe if we're doing things in tandem with standing up a, a database server attached to IIS, uh, that's something we should hit one day in a, a Bolt 200 course for Windows here, but uh, all within the realm of possibility. Um, we'll also see in there that there is some puppet code that is written in YAML. So if you are a person that writes in puppet code, that may seem either awesome or horrific to you. Uh, on the latter side, I'm sorry. On the on the former, it, it's interesting. I, I play with it, and uh, it it definitely works. It's it took me a little of adjustment, but I, I have done some more stuff with it since then. Um, and here's really the, the thing at the end of the day, what we're looking at is why use puppet code, especially if you haven't before. Um, there's 6,500 plus modules out there today. And you can filter by tasks, uh, just the ones that have tasks in them. And you can find ones that will just you know have these ad hoc pieces built. But then you can also use the, the puppet manifest themselves. So figure right now, there is code out there to manage like thousands of things. And if you're starting from scratch on something, it, it doesn't hurt to go to forge.puppet.com, type in the name of that technology in the search field and see what comes back. You look at like IIS, that's something that has been around forever. You know, back to when I started working on, on Puppet and on Windows, um, IIS, Windows features, PowerShell, those types of things are just available straight in the Forge. 
Uh, it's you know really stretched in the window space in the last couple of months. Uh, there was a session today by uh, Michael Lombardi around the, the work they did around the, the DSC builder. So now on top of all the stuff that was available in Puppet for Windows, I can reach out and start using those PowerShell DSC resources as well. So between using PowerShell scripts, any command line tooling, Puppet modules, PowerShell DSC, you have all these options out there to automate something. The fun part is you can do all of those options inside this one tool here. So if we want to wrap it into one workflow, we can mix and match and use the best of what's available wherever it is available. Um, the, the big reason why I've always liked using Puppet, and to that same extent, you know, PowerShell DSC is, is working in that same way. It's desired state code. It's something that works with the uh, item potency. So it's it's not going to make changes unless it has to, but you can run it across your target a million times. So if you see we're writing a script and uh, you know that folder already exists or something, that's going to fail your script out or that's going to clobber the data there. Whereas we can run that puppet module or the PowerShell DSC over and over again. And, and a simple like you know run down here, the, the difference between that is if I'm writing all this PowerShell scripting, I'm doing all this stuff on the left here to, to make the waffle, right? Like I am running down all these things I need to do. I need to go measure. I need, you know, it's just, I, I don't make waffles for the kids for breakfast anymore. It's too much, too much of my life. That's a Saturday thing. Uh, or I just say, ensure a waffle is on this plate and run puppet, right? Like it's, it's a lot easier, especially if you're looking at like, I need to start from zero and get somewhere. I can get you an IIS server that's built in a couple of you know minutes. If I'm brand new to this with Bolt, maybe I've got it within the hour, and then I can repeat that as much as I need to um, versus having to figure out all these other different ways of doing it or write all the various parameters I want to set and their PowerShell equivalents for that. So definitely something to keep in mind as you start working with automation or if you're working with, uh, you know, working more here with Bolt is that it, it's not just, a script flinger. Uh, it's it's not just something to do for like these one-off ad hoc things. You can use it in a desired state way. You're just the only thing you're not getting over Puppet here is that that first of all that centralized execution, and you're not getting that 30-minute enforcement that you would get out of Puppet Enterprise. But you're using that same code base. So yeah, this is an, uh, a model here. What that. Windows feature would look like if we were using Puppet. We can just say, this is the name of the Windows feature. We want to ensure it's present. We want to install the management tools. That's it. We can run that a million times. If it's already there, it's not going to do anything. If it's not, it's going to put it there. So very simple way. Uh, doing it in YAML here. So this is essentially, you'll see inside of that, that plan we're going to run. We have a name for uh, the module is IIS. We have the target it's going to run against. And then instead of saying a script or a command or, or you know what we're doing here, it's the, the resources we're going to manage. And this just maps to what you do in Puppet. So an IIS site called default website, that came out when you ran your you know install Windows feature. We want to remove that. Um, that is one of the bigger nuisances from my life <laughs> of managing IIS sites. Get rid of default website, build the one you want. Uh, so we're going to just throw in my website. We're going to make sure it exists. We're going to make sure that the path is there, and we're going to set up like application pool, things like that. So that is literally Puppet code. If you uh, ran the, the Bolt plan convert from the command line, it would convert that into code that looks very similar to what you would be doing inside of, say, a, a Puppet profile for the web server. Uh, so let's move into exercise seven. I know that was a lot of information, whether it was good or not. Uh, let's let's play with one and actually see what we're going to do here. So in that bolt shop directory, run the bolt plan show bolt shop colon colon build underscore web server. So this is that plan I, I walked through bits of in the slides. It is going to ensure Windows or the web server features installed. It's going to make sure that uh, you know, the, the IIS site is created, the default website is deleted, it's gonna upload files. And then at the end of that, not only do we have our web server, but we have it configured to be, you know, the actual web server with the content we need. So I'm gonna put, um, you know, I'll put 
10 minutes on the board here. This takes a little bit to, to chunk through everything. So I'll check in in about five. Again, if you're running into any issues, feel free to throw that into the chat. Otherwise, I will check in soon.
All right, about four more minutes. Again, if you're having some issues, uh, let us know. Otherwise, as soon as that uh, plan is finished running, you should be able to refresh the page in your browser and see the new information there. All right, I'll give you a two-minute warning here. Again, if you need more time, you have any uh, issues that you want us to address, feel free to throw that over in the chat. All right, we'll go ahead and move on here. Again, if you uh, need some more time on this or if you're running into an issue uh, inside that project, you have an exercises folder that should have exercise seven, which will walk you through these steps as well. So let's review what we've just worked on. Uh, you executed a YAML plan that included uh, not just commands, but also file uploads and, and puppet code that was expressed in YAML. Um, so we were able to mix and match the, the type of thing we were going to run. We were able to, to mix and match, you know, we could mix and match targets in this case, you know, one machine. But every step of the way, you saw that we were specifying a target so we can easily change that back and forth. Uh, and again, that difference with the, the YAML language versus the puppeting, puppet language. Um, you know, it's a little easier to do things like say, I need to take the output of the first step, pump it into the next step. And then we orchestrated several steps here. And, and again, the, the big idea here is it's more getting you familiar with that model. So we could just as easily say, uh, stand up the web server, take care of something with the SQL server, and then put the whole system live. Uh, a great example of using you know, plans and tasks here is in Puppet itself, if you're a Puppet Enterprise user, like patch management there is actually a, a series of tasks and plans that can run that patching process for you. 
So, you know, for there, you also need things like being able to handle a reboot and wait for it to come back online. And, you know, that type of stuff is all available inside the, the Bolt plan framework. Uh, so let's move into exercise eight. We're going to add to that Bolt plan. Uh, so we'll just open that up inside of your text editor of choice. And we're just gonna work with one more piece of puppet code here. We'll add a message of the day. So on the Windows side of things, this is gonna be your login message that asks for okay before you enter credentials. Um, we have one module from the Puppet Forge that'll actually do either uh, Linux or Windows. So we can just say the parameters we want and it'll detect what kind of system it's on and then either edit, you know, on Linux, it's gonna be the uh, slash Etsy MOTD on Windows, it's going to actually be these registry keys that we need to, to operate. Um, so under that last IIS resource, add the MOTD class. Uh, we want to set parameters. So the Windows MOTD title will be warning. The content will be authorized use only. And uh, you can set that, honestly, to whatever you like. But then do the uh, bolt plan run, bolt shop, build web server, and then the targets again. Now, it should take considerably less time. And part of that is the, you know, the way that puppet code is going to work is that it first evaluates to see what the conditions are of that resource. So building that IIS website, it's going to see it already exists. The parameters are already what they need to be. So it doesn't have to take any action to put that into your desired state. It'll say, we validated it, it looks good, and we're moving on. Uh, so the one thing you will see is it's going to find the MOTD is, is new code that's being presented. Uh, it will go ahead and edit those registry keys. Uh, and then we will see an end result come back that actually shows us uh, that there were changed resources in this process. So we'll see uh, there's a little snippet there that says two change resources, none failed, two were unchanged. And those are the differences between you know what we were changing in IIS, what we were changing in MOTD, and uh, so we can get a list of resources and the status at the end of that run. Uh, after that, if you do have remote desktop available, you can go ahead and use those totally secure uh, administrator credentials, try to log into that box, and you should see this uh, you know, warning authorized use only pop up before you're able to do anything there. Uh, so go ahead and work on that. I'll give you, uh, I'll just check in in five minutes. If we're uh, not having any issues, we'll move on from there. Okay, about two, three minutes left. Again, if you need more time than that, if you're running into issues, throw it into the chat and we have somebody who can help you out.
All right, moving on. Again, this is exercise eight in the exercises folder if you need more time with it. Otherwise, we'll move ahead and review. So we can easily add Puppet code to our modules from that Puppet Forge and use it the same way we would if we were writing Puppet code today. Uh, and that you know gives lets you tap into really all this work that's already been done throughout the community and bring that into your projects, regardless if you're a Puppet user or not. Um, when you reapply that code, you see that item potent nature. So we'll get resources that are changed only if they need to be changed. It's not going to try to clobber work that's already been done there. Um, visit forge.puppet.com to take a look at that content. Uh, there's two aspects here that I want to point out. One is going to be the, you know, there's a Windows section where you'd see popular Windows modules, or you can just filter by, you know, ones that are available for Windows and see what's what's out there. Um, the other piece is how-to guides. So there are some things that just get you started a little quicker and let you really kind of kick the tires on what you can do. So things around setting up patch management, uh, deploying Splunk Enterprise, uh, and doing some basic remediation of issues here. Uh, there's guides that'll walk you through what modules you need, how to put them together, how to execute them. So, um, you know, if you want a little more detailed example than, than a simple web server, if you really want to see how far you can get with this, uh, checking that stuff out is definitely the, the way to go. Uh, like I said, a lot of those, you know, low level Windows components you'd use for automation are all there as modules. So managing Windows features, the registry, um, you know, executing just ad hoc PowerShell, you, you, know, you run through command or a task here, uh, tapping into DSC, there, there's just a ton of stuff out there. You can see, you know, each one has a description on how to add it to your, your project, but like I have a SQL Server module that I could start using to, to stand up SQL and start, um, you know, manipulating that. So it's really, you know, there's a ton of stuff out there. I highly recommend if you're especially starting out with a project and you just say like, I know I need to automate for X, uh, go check that forge and see what's already there for you and then and build it out of the, the blocks that have already been put in front of you. Uh, so there's one more thing that I wanna cover here. Uh, this will be a pretty quick one and then I, I think we'll be wrapping for the day. So uh, one of the most recent adds to uh, to Bolt is the ability to do this as PowerShell. Um, so instead of having to learn the context of a new command line tool, if you are familiar with PowerShell, there are functions available for you to use here. You can use the commandlets that map to those commands. Um, so you can see here the same way that you ran that web server using the Bolt plan run, we can invoke a bolt plan with the name parameter being the plan name, targets being the targets. Uh, so you can get, if you run get command and then star bolt, you'll see anything that's uh, capable there. Uh, I believe even past like, mind you, it's a screenshot, but past this, uh, depending on your version, there's gonna be uh, more capabilities there on the PowerShell side as well. And it should be a one-to-one -one map. So essentially anything you can do from the command set with Bolt, you can find the the applicable uh, Bolt uh, or PowerShell commandlet to run as well. Uh, so just to review that, um, we have PowerShell commandlets. Uh, they can be used instead of those traditional Bolt commands. So if you want to say, you know, if you're working in a lot of PowerShell context, it, it's a little easier to stay in that context. You can trigger things that way. Uh, it is an early feature, so uh, I know they, they've added additional capabilities to it, but there are some things that, you know, if you start using it, if you're a person that really works hard with PowerShell and, and you know, moving objects around and trying to pipe things in and out of bolt commands or something like that, um, please let us know, like reach out to us on that, that Puppet Slack or, uh, um, you know, if you have uh, SEs or, or reps you talk to there about how you're using that. Uh, this is something that you know we had asked for inside the Windows community, and we'd love to see what people can do with it and and what more they they'd love to see from it. So let's uh, just wrap it up real quick here. Uh, kind of cover what we did today, and then we'll open it up for some questions if you have any. So what did we do? Um, I stayed on camera for an hour and a half. That's something I did today. 
Uh, we installed Bolt. We created oh two hours even more. Uh, Install Bolt created a project here. We downloaded the project. Uh, we ran commands, ran scripts, executed a task. Um, you know, looked at that YAML plan. We made some modifications there and ran that. So we were able to go from you know nothing to installing some features to building out a web server. Um, we also looked at how we could tap into those modules from the Puppet Forge. So we had some inside of our project we could work with. Uh, we can also go to the forge and, and look at the, the drop down there and how to add those to the project as well. And then we can use those PowerShell commandlets to execute commands just as easily as we could from the, the command line with Bolt. Um, so what happens next here? You will get a recording in today's workshop. Um, I believe there'll be a survey with that. Again, I highly recommend the, the Puppet community. Uh, you can find me at Soldo. It's uh, S-O-U-L-D-O. And uh, the, there's channels for Bolt and Windows that are really great to, you know, if you're stuck somewhere, if you need some help, that's when I started out learning how to do Puppet, that the community was essential uh, to get me unstuck and, and get me moving forward and thinking of things the, the way I needed to think. So definitely check that out if you have the opportunity. Um, we do have more virtual events happening all the time. This was the Windows workshop. We did one earlier today on compliance and security. Um, we'd also love to see feedback. If you know you do want to see more 200 level or, or other use cases, more than happy to, to put those kinds of things together. And then also check out learn.puppet.com. There's some great new resources there. Um, there's some things I uh, believe the I believe they're called the tackle boxes. I can't remember the name of them. They might have changed recently. But you can go in, there's small, really easily consumable pieces there to say, you know, learn how these tasks are, are relevant inside of Puppet Enterprise, if, if that's something you want to look at. And uh, there's a couple of different things there, and they're, they're adding to that list. So definitely worth uh, looking at. Uh, I'll just skip that slide because I don't think those are right. But uh, Q&A time. So if there's any other questions you have, we'll keep this open for another couple of minutes here and uh, just keep the dialogue going. Uh, I can answer them live. Otherwise, uh, if we don't hear from anyone, we'll, we'll just wrap up early and give you some time back on your day. So feel free to use the, uh, the chat or the Q&A sections over there and throw anything you have in it and we will respond. All right, I'm short and I'll give about another minute on the uh, the Q&A there. I know people don't wanna just stare at my face and I'm afraid to turn the video off. So. <laughs> um, one thing I, I will reiterate again, if you're you're still hanging on here, the, uh, so, if you want to play more with what you can do there with that plan, that that same plan we use all day today, you can turn around and point at any Windows virtual machine. It'll be Windows Server. Might get a little angry at trying to install a Windows feature on uh, like a Windows 10 box, um, but you you know it's it's very portable, so you can take that. If if you didn't have time to get through stuff today, or if you wanted to share it with someone else. They can grab that that same project and, and run through those same exercises to get some experience with it. All right. Well, in lieu of any questions here, uh, I think we'll we'll go ahead and, and snap it off for the day. So 
once again, uh, thanks for everybody for attending. I hope you enjoyed Puppetize Digital and, and got some really good content out of it. Uh, another thank you to, to all the moderators there, uh, especially Jeff. <laughs> we you didn't even get to see his picture. And uh, yeah, hope you all have a great day. Thanks.